This is how sake is made in Japan. Whoa! It is snowing, it is so cold out here. So today I am in Nagaoka and the great people at Asahi Shuzo have let me go into their factory and show you how sake is made. But before I start, like always, if you want to see what I'm doing on the daily, check out my Instagram. If you guys want to help support the channel, then definitely check out my Tokyo Japan merch. And if you guys have any questions about Japan or Japan travels, then check out my Discord community. <laughs> it's so cold. It is so cold. All right, let me take you on this factory tour. So here I am in the middle of a snowstorm bringing you another Made in Japan video where I uncover how things are truly crafted in Japan. I really don't know how I get myself into these places but I do know that I love taking you along for the ride. Today we're at Asahi Shuzo and if you're any kind of sake lover you already know about their world famous signature Japanese sake brand Kubota. Dating back to 1830 in Nagoko Japan where they were originally founded as Kubotaya. Now with a total of 170 skillful workers crafting the highest quality Japanese sake each day who've all mastered the secret of Japanese sake brewing techniques passed down from generation to generation. Wow, this place is so massive. There's just so much stuff going on. Let's see what's going on over there. The entire sake factory sits on about 57,000 square meters of Niigata land, consisting of five separate buildings all working together to make it all happen. So this is where it all starts, the rice gets brought into the factory. After all, rice is the main ingredient for making sake. They use 3600 tons of rice a year from fall to spring, with deliveries two to three times a week. In fact, the Niigata area produces the highest rice crop yield in all of Japan. It's commonly said by Japanese sake producers that quality of sake can never exceed the quality of its ingredients, which is probably why the factory uses only rice specifically grown and cultivated for their sake, with its own signature fragrance and taste. So I've made it to the entrance, time to change. Let's do this. Looking good, let's go. Now that I'm inside, let's see if we can go around and find out what everyone is doing. So this is the very first step of the sake brewing process called semi. The raw brown rice must be polished before it can be used to create sake as the outer surface is made up of mostly fat and protein, which creates an odd sake flavor and gets in the way of the intended clear and sharp sake taste. Apparently, some of their sake requires the rice to be so finely polished that less than 50% of each grain is used compared to the rice people normally eat, which is 90%. The entire process is so delicate it takes the machine two to three days to ensure that the grain doesn't crack during the polishing. Once polished, the rice gets inspected by hand to ensure that it passes the factory strict shape and quality standards. Just this attention to detail alone is why it's worth including this in my Made in Japan series. But believe me, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on how this all goes down. Next, the polished rice is moved to the Sakagura, main brewing building, where all the magic happens. The bags of rice arrive in this room where they're opened and the rice is pumped directly to the fourth floor to be washed and soaked. And this is where all the rice gets washed. Even after the polishing, the bran still remains on the rice, which if used as is would add a strange flavor to the sake. So it's critical for it to be washed off. Here. Let's go see what's up here. After it's washed, it then goes into a soaking process. Damn, it's starting to sound like the rice is at a day spa. Let me continue, as this part is pretty important. Timing is everything. Factors such as the type of rice, its condition that year, the polish ratio, weather, humidity, all of it must be taken into account when it comes to how long the rice is washed and soaked. Just to give you an idea on how precise the timing is here, rice used to make their popular kabota manju is washed for 17 seconds and soaked for 10 minutes. Oh, 
Alright, some of you watching with kids, fair warning, the following footage is about to get steamy. Counting down, 3, 2, and 1. Okay, after draining all night, the rice is slowly conveyed through this massive steamer. Unlike rice eaten at home, which is cooked in water, this rice is spread onto a conveyor and steamed continuously in extremely high heat for 40 minutes. During the peak season, the factory steams up to 3 tons of rice every day. But once steamed, it's quickly cooled down and prepared for the next step. Excuse me, what are you doing? So what's the key to steaming rice? How long did it take you to master this process? Uh, okay. Out of curiosity, do you think all this steam helps moisturize your skin? At this point, the inside core of the rice is soft enough that if mashed together, it creates a mochi rice cake consistency. And we're off to the races as the rice gets air pumped through a 40 meter pipe to the next location. While midway through the process, koji seeds are added, which is a specific Japanese mold used for culinary fermentation. Finally, the rice ends up on a flat circular bed in the koji muro, a special room set to exactly 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, to grow the koji mold. This is amazing, the steamed rice is about to get covered now. Naturally, the rice is covered up to increase the koji mold propagation, but a skillful brewer must still open it up and inspect the condition of the rice by touching it regularly, all the while making adjustments over the next two days. Now that the koji mold has had time to grow, the rice koji is moved to another large vat. Apparently, the simple task of mixing the rice koji generates too much heat, so the rice is moved to a specialized vat with a built-in fan at the bottom to cool down the rice koji. When the rice koji is set back on the koji muro, it's important to level the pile as a consistent thickness also helps minimize the surface, helping to keep the moisture and heat inside. After another two nights, the rice koji maturing process is finally complete, and by now, natural enzymes have formed to build a sake's rich flavor and depth. This is why koji is such an essential ingredient in the process. Any skilled sake brewer will tell you that high quality sake can't be made without high quality koji. Oh, mother of sake, what do we have here? Yes, we finally made it to the Shubo area where the brewers get brewing. Here, water and yeast are added to the matured rice koji to create a sake mash which kicks off the alcohol production. You know, the very thing that puts a smile on all our faces. Well, at least my face. Oh, and he's the Toji, aka Master Brewer, responsible for the entire sake production in the warehouse. In fact, the factory has two Master Brewers, each one responsible for their own warehouse and team. Back in the day, sake brewing was very much a seasonal side job, mainly for farmers and fishermen during their off-season. But there were also some sake brewer owners. They often contract hired their toji and workers who learned how to craft sake in specialized schools. These days, larger sake brewers like Asahi Shuzo have their own full-time toji, but many smaller sake makers still follow the traditional system. Hi, can I bother you for a sec? What are you doing? Ah, uh, now. Does it taste like alcohol at this point? So what's the most important part? And what do you like most about all of this? You sound out of breath. <laughs> <laughs>
Then they add more water, steamed rice, and koji three times over four days. The work itself is quite strenuous, but must be performed manually by skilled brewers as machines wouldn't be able to notice the slight changes in the condition of the mash, and therefore couldn't make the necessary adjustments. After this, the sake mash is left to ferment for about a month to fully develop the sake's ultimate taste and aroma. During this time, brewers continue to regularly sample and analyze each tank and make adjustments as needed. This is where the generations of brewing come into play as a factory draws on its decades of experience as well as their own historical data to precisely craft a consistent sake each and every time. Only an experienced and skilled worker could recognize the subtle changes in the condition of the rice and then make the required adjustments ultimately creating the perfect finish. Man, just walking around this factory I get so lost. Oh whoa, what's that? The white crumbly sheets being scraped off is called sake kasu, aka sake lease. But basically, it's the rice and yeast that remains after the sake mash has been pressed to remove the sake. Although not used for sake itself, it's nutritious and used for other purposes such as eating, cooking, pickling, even some beauty products. So before we continue on, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this video, Squarespace. If you all don't already know, Squarespace is the number one way to build your online presence. In fact, I use Squarespace for my website, Tokyo Zebra. Here are just some of the reasons why I love using Squarespace so much. Whether you're starting your passion project or building a business, Squarespace has all the tools to get it done while also looking ultra sleek and professional at the same time. They support numerous portfolios and gallery designs which you can customize and even password protect so the right people see your work. Use its fully integrated blogging tools and commenting features such as threaded comments, replies, and likes to help engage your community. And my personal favorite, built-in analytics to see how your visits, unique visitors, and page views trend over time. So there you go, go to squarespace.com today for your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Paolo from Tokyo and get 10% off your first domain or website. All right, let's continue on with this tour. Are we going on a tour or what? Let's see what's behind this door now. So after the sake is pressed, it's mixed with a fine charcoal powder to absorb unwanted elements such that it would give sake a golden color or even bacteria that could make it unstable. The dark liquid though is passed through a heated filtration machine which removes the charcoal and out comes that clean and clear good good. Oh, I guess this is where they keep all of the tanks. And this is where all that sake ends up. Well, at least for now. It's one of the three storage buildings helping house 400 tanks in total. The sake is stored here from three months to three years until it's perfectly matured. Let's go move on to this building over here. And you'd think that this would be the last part of the process before it's bottled, but it's not. The sake is pumped out of the tanks through a 40 meter pipe to this area where it can be blended into specific sake brands with varying taste profiles while also being tested for consistency and quality before it's bottled and distributed. And as expected, all performed by one of its master brewers. What's going on here? So what separates good sake from great sake? Mm, okay. How long have you been working here? You ever get drunk? Okay, so what's your favorite sake? Kubota no Senju ga ichiban ski desu ne. Other than Kubota? Asahiyama Megara nan desu ga, Asahiyama no Karakuchi Hard toyu o sake ga ski desu ne. Thank you. Oh, okay, so this is where the bottling process takes place. It's been a long road, but we're finally here, where they put the magic in the bottle. I've been so waiting for this one. During busy times of the year, up to 63,500 liters of sake is bottled in one day. And this machine washes up to 1,000 bottles at one time, while also inspecting the tops and bottoms of the bottles. 
Afterwards, the bottles are conveyed to a specialized room where the bottles are filled with sake. These machines can fill up to 4,000 bottles in one hour. That's a whole lot of love in a short amount of time. Makes me smile for some reason. After the bottles leave the filling room, all are inspected manually one by one. Let's talk to the lady doing the inspection over there. Hi, can I ask what you're doing? So are there any secrets that you can share with me? Oh, do you always keep that in your pocket? <laughs> do you find a lot of defects? Now, all the bottles are labeled by their specific brand, and here they use handmade Japanese washi paper for their kubota manju and senju labels. Since each label has its own slightly unique thickness and size, the workers must always be ready to make adjustments. Hey, can I just sit back for a sec and enjoy the bottles going down the line? Finally, the bottles are packaged and boxed by automated machines. The entire bottling and packaging process taking about 40 to 50 minutes. And from here, the sake bottles get shipped all throughout Japan and even the world for everyone to enjoy. Well, maybe not everyone. You obviously gotta be of age. So I don't know about you guys, but this whole sake tour is getting me a little bit thirsty. Maybe I can find a place to drink. Oh, and here we are, Kabota Sake Bar in Shibuya. So this bar is located in the basement of Shibuya Parko in Tokyo. Here you can enjoy their sake. And if you fancy a taste testing, they have that here too. Feels good to be out from the cold and look at here, got a perfect glass of Kabota Sake. Let me just take a drink. That is how sake is made in Japan. If you guys like this video, help me out and hit that like button. If you guys want to see more videos like this or anything related to Japan, hit that subscribe button and the bell button. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.